I'm good, ready to rock and roll. Yay. I love these. These webinars give me so much energy. It makes me so happy to see you all here. <clears throat> all right, let's get started. Um, welcome, <laughs> everybody, to Happy Handling. Uh, this webinar is all about cooperative care, and I've kind of titled it Empowering Humans to Care for Their Dogs Cooperatively. Um, and I, it's a topic that's really close to my heart. I've had my own journey in this area with one of my dogs in particular, and I'll be talking a lot about it over the webinar. Um, let's just chat about our agenda to get started, what we're going to be doing, a little overview. It's always nice to know what's going to happen, <laughs> which is something we'll talk about in our webinar today. <laughs> uh, the agenda, we're going to start off just talking about cooperative care. What is it? What is this happy handling? What does this mean? Um, and we're going to then split into two different areas, going in to talk about patient-centered care, cooperative care in more depth, um, and how we can facilitate that in the various ways we can. And then we're going to dive a little bit more into no choice moments, which is something I'll go into. <laughs> to get started, I guess, be before we get started, this is by no means going to be a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide <laughs> in how to train your dog to do these different things. This is meant to be like a taster. It's meant to be giving you an idea of the different concepts and the different things that we can achieve with our pet dogs, even our really sensitive pet dogs. Uh, so I just think that's well worth talking about. And a broad disclaimer, um, if you're seeing any aggression, snapping, biting, lip curling, around your dogs being touched that's something that you need to work with both a medical professional and a training professional for so this webinar is intended as extra free knowledge for everybody but by no means does it actually substitute for real care given by a qualified provider an experienced provider so you're really going to be needing to work with a dog trainer you're going to be needing to work with a veterinarian if you're seeing those big kind of potentially dangerous behaviors. Um, that being said, <laughs> let's talk today about some of the things you'll be doing um, on your and your dog's healing journey, the things that I've done with my own kind of uh, process with my dog Hera, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to leave today feeling really excited about the journey ahead and the way that we kind of can transform our communication. I realize I haven't even introduced myself, so maybe I'll start there. Uh, my name is Krishma. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm head of training and behavior at CCA. Uh, and I consider myself at this point, like seven years into my work with dogs as like a sensitive dog expert. Like I, I work a lot with sensitive dogs, disabled dogs, dogs who have a lot of trauma, um, dogs who are genetically prone to being fearful or avoidant uh, and often in really intense urban environments that just seems to be my niche and it's the niche of all of our trainers at CCA we all kind of fell into work together because we have our own sensitive dogs and uh, we together have literally nerded out like so much trying to learn everything that we can if you want to learn more about our certifications this is just these are just two of many you can check out our website the about us section explains it a little bit more um but calm canine academy the group um that we are a part of is a a group of international dog trainers and behavior consultants who collaboratively work together on cases uh especially really challenging cases we work 100 percent virtually through private and group coaching programs and cooperative care is something that we we love to work with our clients on because especially cooperative care it's often done mostly in the home or it's done in a really structured way and so we thought why not bring out this new webinar explaining the kind of different things that we're thinking about in our works with these dogs uh, and uh, the kind of things we think you should know so let's get started uh <clears throat> and ask this first question what is cooperative care so th this webinar is told called happy handling but cooperative care is a kind of word that you might want to is like if you want to put something on a search engine it's like a buzzword cooperative care is something that we've been doing with zoo animals and other big confined animals for decades and it's finally something that we're doing with our dogs and also our kids I think I'm seeing more and more in like the gentle responsive parenting world um and what does it even mean I mean let's start off with a definition and this definition is by um 
fantastic dog trainer who I saw in a podcast and I'll link that podcast underneath so that you can all listen to it um but when asked what cooperative care was she said patient-centered care that considers the emotional health of the animal and not just the physical health so I love that just like as a little summary like a real little juicy summary just there patient-centered care that con considers the emotional health not just the physical health there are things we need to do to provide care for our dogs who are captive animals who don't really understand what's going on <laughs> and many medical professionals are only really taught how to handle the animal so that the animal doesn't get injured and so the practitioners don't get injured it's kind of now coming into the forefront of medical care that we should be considering emotional health as much as we're considering physical health and I really <laughs> I wish I was told this when I first got my first dog. And let's be honest, I actually was told this, but I didn't listen. Um, I wish it was just made more obvious to me how important this is, um, because there's so many different areas that we're going to have to be giving them care. These are just some. There are probably others. If anyone has, if I've missed anything, this is just off the top of my head, the like big areas that we work with. But let me know if there are others that we've missed here. Um, we're thinking about grooming body handling and veterinary care. These sorts of things are really important. <laughs> They're every day. Every single day, we're gonna be giving them uh, little nail trims or brushing them or giving them regular baths, wiping them off, toweling them down, you know, picking that thing out of their eye. <laughs> um, body handling will involve things like leashes, harnesses, that kind of stuff. Literally just petting your dog standing over them leaning over them spatial pressure or restraining them if necessary as well as like inspections you know had to inspect my dog's penis the other day so fun um has to happen you know sometimes you got to get in there and have a look um that, to give them care so how are we going to do that <laughs> if, if they don't like it right um and obviously veterinary care so that could be inspections by a veterinarian, using tools, needlework, which I mean, <laughs> needlework's my slang term for like injections and blood draws and stuff like that. Um, and like treatments for different things and medications. So the list goes on and on and on, right? There are so many more, I'm sure, that folks could think about and pop in the chat. Um, many, many different things. And cooperative care asks this question, how do we center this animal's emotions in providing this care? I've definitely said this to people before and they've been like, they're a dog. I don't care about that. And honestly, I'm not here today to argue about that. <laughs> that could be another webinar if I to, to argue about, you know, the moral agency of of these animals and whether or not they feel a brain, broad range of emotions and our ethical obligations to them, except that's another, a whole other thing. <laughs> I'm not gonna sell that today. I'm really just gonna talk about it a little bit more from like a practical aspect here. Practically, this is important. Not even ethically, practically it's important. <laughs> I mean, obviously ethically, but practically, the emotional welfare of the animal is at stake here. And I don't know if, if you live with a sensitive animal, if you live with an animal that's been traumatized, it's a lot of work. It's hard to watch. It's emotionally draining for the guardian, for the ant, for the dog. And if you have to, like my poodle here, this is Hera, <laughs> isn't he gorgeous? He's six years old now and he's a poodle and he needs to be groomed intensely. He needs to be brushed and washed and shaved in between his toes, his crotch, his everything needs to be shaved. He has a hair coming out of his ears. I need to do this stuff every day. He will and has been a mess, an emotional mess, just off the back of me having to provide the basic necessary care. That is hugely problematic for him as emo and emo his emotional and like health. Also for me, it just sucks, right? So it's important for their emotional welfare, also super important for their medical welfare, because one of the biggest reasons that we see dogs not getting adequate care, veterinary care, is because they're so stressed that the guardians avoid it, the dog you know, isn't able to be seen easily without lots of money being spent, et cetera, et cetera. 
firsthand, me and here have experienced this before um, with a chronic ear infection. It's been really hard to get the care that he needs with such a sensitive, tender area um, on a budget because I am on a budget, you know, cost of living crisis. I'm 30 years old. <laughs> I, I'm being realistic. Um, it's a challenge. So having dogs that feel good about the care they need is going to make them emotionally better and medically more healthy which is good for you as the guardian good for them good for everyone and that's what i mean by protects that interspecies relationship hero also struggles with new people woohoo so fun uh, and so if he has to go to the vet and be absolutely traumatized every time how do we think that's going to affect his anxieties around people it's going to make it 10 times worse right so i want to protect their trust in us i want to protect their optimism around human beings um, it just makes for a better life together. Uh, and personally, I want to keep my animals feeling safe. I want to maintain their perceived sense of safety on a daily basis, as much as possible. You know, um, At the end of all of this, we get increased confidence, we get optimism, we get improved trust, we get improved behavior, more responsive dogs, dogs who have you know, a huge amount of trust in us and that's really helpful <laughs> when you need them to turn away from that squirrel that's running away, <laughs> you know, so integratively, integratively important. I see people also say that their dogs get more cuddly, more loving with them off the back of integrating cooperative care. And I've seen it firsthand with my dogs as well. As well. It's amazing. Um, I truly believe they, in, they like it. They need it, actually. Sorry. I truly believe they need it. Um, can you tell it's important to me? It's an important thing to me. Um, I really care about this. <laughs> Let me know if you care about this or if you have any experiences with this, because many people have had experiences as kids, for example, um, you know, not having cooperative care. <laughs> uh, and you remember that, right? I think. Let me know in the chat if uh, you are hearing anything or feeling anything like that. All oh, right. So we talked a little bit about what cooperative care is, patient centered care that considers the emotional health of the dog, not just the um, physical health of the dog. And we kind of talked about some of the cooperative care areas like grooming, body handling and veterinary care and why cooperative care is so important. Um, I would love if you're in the chat in the, in the, the room right now to just let me know in the chat, like what cooperative care goals you're here or because of like what is it that's going on with you guys <laughs> um is it that you're struggling with bath time or is it that you're struggling to brush your dogs nails 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 oh my god nails are always the first one <laughs> i love it it's just like this wave of nails in the in the chat fear of the vet and groomer grooming or grooming brushing Oh gosh, yeah, I remember how much it hurt to have the knots brushed out of my hair when I was little. And think about this when I'm trying to brush Alma. That's so interesting, Alison. I have the exact same thing. I have really curly hair. And my parents ended up chopping all my hair off when I was a kid because I'm also like autistic and have ADHD. So like my sensory stuff was really I would freak out when they were brushing my hair. And they just cut they ended up chopping it all off. My dad cried. Um, but I was pleased. And I do that with Hera, actually. You know, like I keep his hair short. You can see in this picture. I keep it short because he, I think he looks the cutest fluffy, but he doesn't care. <laughs> just like me, I didn't care. I just wanted to feel good. Is teeth, bath, vet, particularly legs, stuff. That is such a challenging one for Hera as well. Bath, good. We're going to be chatting about all of these today in a little bit, at least. You know, we're going to touch upon all of this. Oh, I remember being left alone at the dentist and sc for screaming. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, I mean, these things were normal. Normal, you know, 50, uh, 30 years ago or so. It's starting now to change with our with the ki our kids and also with our dogs as well. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today and talk a little bit about the ways that we can actually integrate patient centered care. I just love this phrase patient-centered care patient of course why would it not be patient-centered um but actually it often isn't patient-centered and, and capitalism the medical model the medical industrial complex all of this sets up the medical practitioners and even the groomers and stuff to maybe not be able to provide patient-centered care in every opportunity and that's just the reality it's no one's fault i don't blame anyone but i do think it's worth saying because I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but I and lots of my clients certainly have, both for themselves and for their dogs, right? 
So patient-centered care is always something that I have in my head, um, knowing that patient-centered care is also going to lead to really good results for us and good things for us. And I'm going to talk about two key like areas, two of the key things that that to me make up patient-centered care. And literally, this is just my opinion. <laughs> this is just my opinion. This is not the like holy grail. This is just what I've learned working over the last seven years. And the first thing that I'm thinking about with patient-centered care is building feelings of safety. And I love this picture of here. I just think he's like giving me the stink eye. You know, he's like, what? What do you want? Um, and well, there was a lot of suspicion with Hera and I after a few years of really toxic <laughs> care practices where he bit me, where I got frustrated, where I wasn't my best self, I wasn't patient, <laughs> I wasn't centering him. Um, and I just didn't know any differently. And it, that's okay. <laughs> like we just learn and we move forward. Um, but the first thing we have to think about is those feelings of safety. Um, so, so important to uh, to think about. And this is complex. We're talking about lots of different things. People have been talking in the chat, you know, nails, baths, veterinary care, grooming, so many different things. Um, in a nutshell, we have to identify what the triggers are and then build a plan to change your dog's association first and foremost. Um, that's That's the first thing that we're going to be thinking about. And I've just got a few examples here with like, cute videos <laughs> i thought we need some cute videos let's get some dopamine uh let's look at some cute dog videos and i want to hear if you have any questions if you've ever tried this with your dog so the first one i'm going to show you is building safety with um equipment now there are, there are some equipment that you can build feelings of safety with your dogs around like this muzzle for example good I'm actually going to mute it. I don't really think you need to watch, to listen to the noise, the sound. You can always watch it back a few times when you get the slideshows. I think just the visual is enough for us now. Um, but in this video, you'll see me building some good feelings with Hera around his muzzle, which he has to wear for grooming procedures um, because he's bitten people before. Um, and I'm just playing fun, silly games. Fun, silly games. <laughs> fun, silly games is the theme of this webinar. Fun, silly games to help build a sense of safety. And I would do this with him throughout the day. Say you have a dog who runs away when the eardrops come out or something like that. You might be doing something like this, a game where you're just pairing it with food, something simple like that. The details of which, honestly, I'm not going to go into today because if I went into every detail of every exercise that we're going to look at, I'd be here for weeks. So I'm just giving you an idea. Maybe you'll have, be able to like visualize your future and what it's going to look like with your dogs. So maybe we're thinking about wearable equipment. We're teaching them to put it on. We're making them feel good and comfortable uh, with that piece of equipment. Maybe it's actually to do with an environment. Maybe we're trying to get them on a grooming table or in the bathtub. And um, this is Baboy, who is known on Instagram as Dog With Sign, which <laughs> is quite famous. I just think it's hilarious that Baboy is so famous. Check her out if you haven't. Um, and she's doing her evening like activities that she does every evening, a little snuffle mat in the bath with a yoga mat there to make sure that she's not slipping and she's comfortable. Uh, and you could start just in the bathroom. Hell, I've started in the corridor outside the bathroom with some dogs, right? And we build up over time. Uh, but get building safety with strange spaces or confined spaces like bathtubs, bathrooms, grooming tables is going to be a kind of simple, easy way to do it. You see I'm using a lot of food here, but it doesn't have to be food. You can use play if you want, if that works for your dog. Um, or anything else that makes them feel really, really good. And we get really creative sometimes with the ways that we construct training plans for dogs based off of their individual sensitivities. Um, <clears throat> I hear a lot of folks chatting about vets uh, and we're going to talk, I'll talk more about it because having a really good collaborative relationship is so important and so achievable. Um, it, it, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> What about introducing new tools? We got a few questions about introducing new tools from folks um, at the, when we were writing this webinar. Um, I often, again, play silly little cute games. So in this video, Spooky the Spaniel is introduced is being introduced to the Dremel, those little like grindy tools for the first time. Maybe you have a dog that was really upset by a, a tool or piece of equipment. You could play a game where you just show it to them. 
And what I'm doing is marking, I'm going, yes, or actually I'm clicking a little clicker and giving him a cookie. And he just starts offering these pouring behaviors because we've been working on pour later earlier on in that day, which was really adorable. But if you don't have a negative association already with the tool, introducing them in a way like this that encourages like creativity and play. And you look how silly he is. He's so cute um, and really easy and fun for him, like and for me as well, to be honest. Um, is really, really excellent. Uh, so these sorts of safety building games can be so, so fun. You could intersperse some, what does your dog like to toss a toy around, play some tug? What is it that they enjoy? Um, uh, and, and then how can we kind of build some good, good feelings around this? Look how cute he is. Oh, he's so cute. Do you wanna look, look let's listen to the, the sound on this one just for a little bit and have a little, have another little watch of it. Cause this was a really cute one. <laughs> Oh, maybe I don't have sound on this video. Weird. How strange. Oh, well, no big deal. Um, don't forget that either linked below if you're watching the recording or we'll, we will be sent out to you the slide deck where you'll be able to watch all of these videos again if you want to. So don't worry about not catching everything first time. So we've talked about spaces. We've talked about um, equipment, wearable equipment. We've talked a little bit about new tools. Someone's asking, what if they have a negative association with this with a tool? Can we still do something like this? Absolutely, yes, you can. Um, you just often have to really split it up into little steps for them. So in this video here, Spooky is able to touch the Dremel. I'm able to turn it on. I'm able to like wave it around and he doesn't have any bad association. So he's like, woo, <laughs> maybe you're just holding it by your side for the first session and giving him a yes and a treat for just coming up to you, <laughs> you know, start meet them where they're at. Um, the details of where we should be working them in terms of how much we should push, et cetera, we do not want to be pushing them to to be seeing stress or anxiety. In fact, we want this body language, loose, goofy, playful, forward leaning, investigative, curious. Um, that's what we're looking for. Sorry, he really makes me laugh. He's such a funny puppy. He's old now. Like, not old. He's like three years old now, but it's just so cute seeing these old, old videos of him. <laughs> The details of this are often best hashed out with a professional, to be perfectly honest, especially if we have a negative association already, because we don't want to lose trust from the dog. We're building up trust in these exercises. We're building up a sense of safety. And I think about it like a bank account. We're putting into this bank account of safety, safety, safety. Actually, this is a really fun thing. Um, and lastly, my last example here is about, oh, look, we have noise sound for this one. This last video is about uh, spaces. So someone's mentioned groomers and veterinary officers. Uh, this is an example of what we'd call a victory visit or a happy visit. There are many different ways to say it, but just if your dog is really scared of going to the vet, we're gonna have to be building some good associations with the veterinary office. Maybe you move vets and start fresh. <laughs> We've done that before. Um, maybe you're gonna rebuild trust in the current vet because you have a really good relationship or groomer you're probably gonna be taking your dog there and playing silly little games, <laughs> silly little games to help them feel good. Uh, maybe you do this just on the street of the vet clinic for, to start off with, but building up to being able to just pop in, play a few games and leave. <laughs> uh, in this video is actually quite an advanced version. Dina, this little sausage dog is uh, practicing putting her muzzle on in the vet office. So combining kind of two of these things together uh, and making it look a lot more like the real picture. And every time we do these exercises, it's like cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Money is going in a bank account um, for these various different trigger stimuluses. Dina is a legend. She literally is. She's also like one of the most like is it weird that I'm going to say this? One of the sexiest sausage dogs I know. She's like so muscly and like coordinated and like so cool, like such a muscly dog. I don't know. I never usually see like such like cool looking, fit, sporty sausage dogs. I guess I don't see. Anyway, focus. Anyway, <laughs> my dog is obsessed with the vet office because we did lots and lots of happy visits. Exactly. You have a bursting bank account full of uh, good feelings around the vet uh, and we might at some point have to withdraw from that bank account, right? And that's why we're filling it up so much with these silly little games. Um, someone's asked some questions about this. How do you simulate a grooming table at home? 
So often I have done things like putting non-slip mats on tables and then created like little steps up for them or something like that to practice stationing on something that looks like a grooming table. I've also had clients who have, you know, like struck a deal with their groomer and just been like, I'll pay you 10 bucks if I can just hang out and practice for like 10 minutes with the dog on a walk or something like that. That could also also happen if you have a dog that really struggles with grooming making these efforts for me is really worth it like if you're going to be putting your time into something this is definitely something that can be really really helpful all right oh this is a really good question from Jody here um so suggestions for those with health issues um dogs that have mental health or um maybe they have uh physical health issues and their energy or motivation are very low and they can't keep their oh sorry you're talking about yourself and you can't keep the momentum up so you're starting from the beginning every time I mean it applies to both dogs and humans right like if we're struggling with it with that consistency um of being able to do this work one big thing that I'll say is that's really normal <laughs> like we've all been there I go in and out of that feet of that myself and I think one big thing I'll say is that this is going to be a longer process. It's not going to be something that we just like fix in a few months. And that's absolutely fine. Me and my dog are six years into our relationship. The first two to three years were like, oh, I was still learning. And then from like three to six, I really pulled it together a little bit better. Um, and we're still working. Uh, we're still we're miles better than where we started, but we're still on that journey of like, harm reduction of making it more and more and more cooperative because often we can't it can't be perfect straight away so be kind to yourself and be kind to the dogs as well because you're we're all going to be inconsistent and that's fine um that was like for myself as well so thank you Jodie that was a really good question um and the being consistent is probably the most challenging part of this that's why I find working within a program with a trainer or having like friends that you're doing this with joining a Facebook group some sort of community can be really helpful where you're getting reinforcement for the work that you are doing because even if all you do is hold the eardrops and throw chicken while laying down and watching Real Housewives that's it that's perfect that's corporate care you're doing it um so lots of a few different thoughts there but um firstly very normal to the timeline is a little bit long for these things and partially this is why because we're all gonna be up and down us and the dogs so when talking about patient-centered care building feelings of safety is the first thing that we need to be doing and the second thing we need to be thinking about is how we can once they're feeling good enough and our bank account is full enough how we can start to give them more choices now this was something that I struggled with at the beginning because it got to the point with me and Hera where like I'd turn the bath on and he'd run and hide and then he'd growl at me if I tried to approach him or I he'd see the the clippers and he'd run away immediately and hide and so people would be like you got to give him choice and I was like what does that mean like how is he ever going to say yes he hates this um the thing that's really interesting is that very frequently giving dogs the power to say no uh, will actually, and clarity around when they have choice and when they don't, will actually lead to them saying yes so much more. I think that often we are afraid of giving animals this power, but they respond really well to having the agency and the autonomy over their bodies. And you might not be able to have the perfect cooperative care routine straight off the bat. I don't it's fine. <laughs> um, but we can start to introduce some of these ideas in at the far beginning, you know, small games. And I'm going to show you just some examples of games and things that we've worked on and we work on with dogs um, to help build choice and agency in various ways. Um, hopefully we'll be starting to touch on a bunch of these specific things like nail, like nail trims, etc. The first thing that we're going to talk about is just petting your dog when you pet your dog um and the contingencies under which we do when I first got here if he was laying down on the couch I would frequently go up to him and just like hug him or cuddle him or give him kisses and I didn't realize how much that was taking from my bank account with him just in little pieces throughout the day um so thinking about consent around touching our dogs 
whether that's big things like, you know, picking them up or little things like taking boogers out of their eyes. Did any of you have like picky parents? I had a very picky South Asian mom, <laughs> you know, always just like grabbing at me, tightening things. It gets annoying after a while and it can just build feelings of frustration towards that individual. So thinking about that consent on a day to day, minute by minute basis, not just with you, but everyone who interacts with your dog should be doing this. Uh, an example is consent checks. So um, petting your dog if you want to pet them, asking them, petting them a bit in a way that they often like. So this under the, ch the chin scratch is often good. And then seeing if they ask for more by pausing and you can see Dina's going, uh, more please human. So kind of creating like on tap petting a little bit, giving them the chance to say, I want more and teaching them that you can ask them and honor what they say. What if they said no? What would Dina have looked like if she'd said no, I guess is my next question. So we're petting, we're saying, hey, Dina, do you want to cuddle? You came up to me on the couch and you look like you want something. Um, how do you feel about this? Remove your hand. Dina could just stand there or she could look away or she could lick her lips or she could walk away even. Um, unless she's giving clear yeses, that's a no, right? Unless it's an enthusiastic, unconflicted yes, it's going to be we're like, okay, no worries. You can come back when you're ready and kind of almost play a little bit hard to get there. I challenge you all to do this for a few weeks at least and see how your dogs respond because often they're rehearsing saying, yes, touch me, touch me, touch me so much. It becomes a strengthened behavior and they learn that they can turn it off if they want to by saying no in a subtle way. And that strengthens that subtle no behavior so that you're both learning how to communicate with each other better. Petting consents have been a huge game changer for my dog and I, for me and Hira as well. But you know what, though? I got a little bit offended because Hira said no a lot more than I thought at the beginning. About two years ago, when I kind of rehauled everything with our handling and like the way I was approaching touching him, um, he said no a lot. And it took a long time, I feel like, before the yeses started coming more fluently. Um, I feel like I needed to prove to him, I know that's so like non-scientific of me, but I kind of had to prove to him that, no, I'm fine. Okay, no, I really mean it. Like, you, you, I, won't, I won't pet you, it's fine. And my like silly little rejection sensitive brain was like, oh, you're so mean for not wanting me to touch you. But you know what, that's, that's okay. It's not mean, it's just, it's neutral. It's just what they need and that's okay. Um, I love that, Jody. Started giving them the choices of which toys they want to play with and pick the treats they want. I love that. These are great other ways that we can add small, lots of little choices into our dog's days, like a toddler, like a toddler, right? Like, do you want to wear this outfit or this outfit? It's like the illusion of choice, the perceived safety. This is the thing that we're looking for. So one way that we can give them choices by thinking about consent and teaching them how to say yes and no and just integrating that throughout our day as much as possible. Second thing we can do is to teach them to participate in activities uh, and procedures if that's a possible. It's not always possible, but sometimes you can teach dogs to like help. <laughs> so an often one that we teach, and I saw lots of folks are struggling with nails, is scratch boards, at least for the front nails at least for like the short term use to kind of keep the nails down while we work on other things like poor handling. This dog is blind and almost totally deaf. Um, and she's learning this. I'm going to play it with the sound in a minute so you can hear it. But you can see she's learning to like put her paws on what is a, a board that's cut, got a layer of sandpaper on it. You can really easily buy this sticky sandpaper at department, not department stores, where like what's it called? Hardware stores. And we put it on a clipboard here. And the, the goal is that she's getting her little feet and putting them on the cardboard. So what we're doing is hiding a tree underneath and she's digging. And when she digs, she gets a, a cue from us that she did the right thing, which is yes. Or actually no, it's a click because she's very deaf. She needed a clicker um, and she gets her cookie. So let's watch that whole thing again. This is just one example. I wanna hear about your experiences with scratch boards. Um, if you've been struggling, this is something that really having a professional eye on it can be really helpful. And Jodie, you're hundred percent right. It's much harder with the back paws. Let's check out what it looks like first steps there with the front paws or what it can look like.
I just think it's so cool that this dog is blind and almost totally deaf <laughs> and she's old as well I think she was about nine years old and she's learning how to scratch her nails on this scratch board her guardian had tried this before working with us and hadn't been able to do it because sometimes it takes like especially with sensitive dogs some tips and tricks of the trade that we've learned over time to kind of change setups and experiment to see what's going to work for that dog we've got some questions or some like um, comments from folks saying you know my dog doesn't scratch hard enough for it to make a difference um or they strongly prefer one paw or another one that we get is they only scratch in one particular motion pattern which only files down the nails on one side these tiny little training quandaries that's what we're for right you want to learn how to get your dog to scratch the left side of their nail a little bit harder we're the nerds for you. I don't think I can do it in this format because I need to see what your dog's doing. I need to get videos of your training. I need to give you small adjustments over time, et cetera, et cetera. It's a process that we go through. Um, but in 90% of cases, that's completely made up statistic. <laughs> I do think though, generally, we can see success with the scratch board for the front nails on the majority of dogs. If that is something that you want to achieve, I firmly believe it's, it's probably possible if it's not it's usually something that's potentially medically going wrong with the dog so Hera has um really sensitive uh feet and he will not scratch on the scratch board if he has an ear infection because I think his ear infection just makes him more sensitive and he's like more trigger stacked so he won't do this cooperative care procedure so I've definitely had times where I've been like, why won't you do this? What's wrong with you? <laughs> like, why won't you just scratch? You're, you, you, why, why are you only scratching with this paw, for example, whatever? And it's always there's something else going on, right? There's something medical going on or they're uncomfortable in some way or there's a mistake that we're making. But often medical is, is a, a firm bet. So we're looking at like the details of your training and we're looking at potential medical things that could be kind of adding to the mix. Isn't it amazing how things all add together and how complicated, complicated behavior is. Um, Maya says, I use a cutting board with 80 grit sandpaper stuck to it and love it. Amazing. I love that. If you like hashtag scratch board on Instagram, you'll find so many tutorials <laughs> or just scratch board into YouTube. You'll find so many tutorials. Um, and it is, it's a really fun one to teach them, honestly, really, really fun. So uh, we can give them consent checks. We can try to ask them for their opinion on things and honor their opinion on things as much as possible. We can teach them to be collaborative in the process of their care, the processes of their care. Uh, and But sometimes we need to go a little bit further and more nuanced with our communication and this is where I'm going to pause this for a moment, but this is where start buttons or opt in behaviors or consent handling or the bucket game comes in. These are all just labels for what is mostly the same idea um, with small variations. Uh, the idea here is that say we have a dog that is really sensitive about something and you know, you're trying to feed them cheese and it's just not cutting it, you know, <laughs> like uh, we need to get more nuanced here. This is often what I will do. I will teach the dogs a behavior of some sort that indicates that they are ready. So common behaviors we use, the one you'll see in this video here is a chin rest. So teaching our dogs to rest their chin on something, <laughs> very cute, uh, but also functional. I'll, I'll explain more in a moment. Another option is laying flat on their side, like a side lay, um, another, another nice uh, option, or you can teach them to stand and chin rest on something, basically present them, but their body, <laughs> we teach them to present themselves in some way for inspection. And it becomes a fun game that we play. So in this video here, I'll play it again without with the sound. Um, but in this video, I'm practicing with Hera laying down on the mat, uh, and then putting his chin on this rolled up blanket, because I want him to be comfortable. My goal is that he is able to rest his chin on the mat. And when he does, I start moving. He gets intermittently rewarded for just hanging out on the mat. So I'm not even trying to touch him. I'm just playing this game. When you put your chin down, I'm going to do weird things. And then I'm going to give you a cookie. <laughs> I'm doing really weird stuff, but I'm not touching him at all. Not touching him at all. 
this is the first part of our game, which we, the start button game, the opt-in game, the consent handling game, whatever you're going to call it, is I want him to be able to offer these behaviors while I put makeup on myself, <laughs> while I brush my own hair, while I touch my own body um, or touch something next to him. And I'm giving him, Cookie, a lot of reinforcement throughout. Now, there are details to this kind of training, such as what happens if the dog doesn't opt in or what happens if the dog opts out? For example, what if I'm re reaching my hand over his head and he raises his head? What do I do then? Again, it's too much for us to go into today, but the general idea is we reward the no as much as we reward the yes. And we listen to the first no. We don't push over and over and over again, trying to turn that no into a yes. Basically consent basic consent rules apply you know like you're raising raising a teenage boy these are the sort of conversations we'd have right like if they say no it's a no we don't push again or we make it much easier we just like hang out uh, together or play an easy game together that doesn't involve me touching you we have to teach the dogs that within the context of this game we will listen to you within the context of this game the tiniest whisper of no will be listened to um let's have a little look with some sound um so you can hear when I'm using this marker, now this marker is a clicker in this case. I do like using clickers for cooperative care. Um, it helps me be more present with him in this moment because I have to make sure that I don't do what I often do, which is just ignore his nose. Um, so let's have a little look. We might have lost audio there for a minute. Let me just fix that. Can you hear me? Just checking. Thank you. Sorry, I just unplugged my mic by accident. All right, hopefully you got the idea from that little guy. I'm, this video was taken almost two years ago and I'm seeing subtle signs of stress now that I didn't uh, I didn't notice then. And I probably would have made it easier <laughs> if I was my client now. <laughs> I would have coached them to do some things differently, but that's why we take these videos, right? And that's how we work with our clients back and forth like this. What are you using as the chin rest? Oh, it's just a rolled up blanket, but um, I want him to be as comfortable as possible to make the behavior as likely as possible. Um, and asking him to chin rest on his paws, it just didn't feel like it was very comfy for him. Um, I really roll out the red carpet for him, my poo-poo. Um, he's so good. Let's see what this might look like applied to actual procedures. So this video is of that side lay sits behavior. So not the chin rest, but the side lay. And uh, we're working on touching actually the dog in this one. So this is kind of a later stage one. I think they've been working for about four months. Um, this dog is an adolescent dog though and rescue with lots of anxiety. And he, he just had to blink it really easy at the beginning. Uh, but you can see that he's showing very little sign of discomfort uh, at his paws being touched. Um, and he is throwing his head back down <laughs> you know, do it again do it again like really really forcefully and those little things matter when we're doing this training with you guys we'll be thinking about the intensity of the opt-in how long did it take for them to opt in these tiny little subtle signs make a really big difference um and I saw a few of the subtle signs in the video with Hera <laughs> I don't see many in this one this dog's looking great uh, and this is one of my my clients that I I was coaching uh, again almost two three years ago now. Gosh, these videos are old. We've got to make some new videos. They're so good though. Um, <laughs> let's look at ear uh, ear care. So this is fake. That's a, a I think that's a CBD tincture. Um, we're just practicing. <laughs> so the silly little game becomes: Can you do these behaviors while we play doctor? Literally playing doctor. And you'll notice we have props like this blanket that indicates that we're playing this game and this blanket comes out every time we're playing the game uh, so the dog knows exactly what's going to happen 
the dog doesn't have to be asked to do the thing they're just offering it willingly and enthusiastically that's the criteria that's how good the training needs to be and I think of husbandry and like cooperative care it's like it's like you know when you see flashy healing with the dogs and they look really impressive and they're healing and they're like really in it with the with the people I'm like this is cooler (laughs) like this is a bigger training challenge to me than the flashy heel work um and it can take many many months to build this because remember giving them choices is the second thing we do after building feelings of safety so sometimes we're spending a few months just building feelings of safety so that we can then work on them giving them having choices because sometimes that's what it takes and with me and Hero we had like it took about a year I think before I was really really seeing progress with him great question how many minutes per day how many days per week do you formally do this literally depends on the dog right so if we have a dog who struggles with enthusiasm and has a low appetite or a low interest in working with human beings in this way probably 30 seconds a day 60 seconds but again totally depends on the dog uh there are other dogs for for whom we could do this for much much more regularly multiple little sessions throughout the day for example is often my favorite way to do it and by little sessions two to three minutes max um get it out do the thing put it away but again it really depends on some dogs it's like with humans right like there's so much variability that we often have to uh really just pivot and be work on our be on our toes and take lots of different pieces of data into consideration um, around that dog each individual dog all right lena saying thank you so much for telling us how long things take often um you question your training because you have no idea how long it'll take and that puts a lot of pressure on yourself when something doesn't work within a few weeks gosh yes that's such a good point and i have been there myself as well I think the biggest piece of advice that, and the thing I would say to myself is let go of the end goal. Let go of the end goal. Every training session, that's all it is. It's just one training session that you have to video and your goal is to show up as your best self with them, not to clip the nail. I know it, it's hard, (laughs) really hard for me. (laughs) I'm like very goal driven. Um, but it's actually like quite spiritually fulfilling to experience doing that. And then actually it works out like it, it's actually that's the way to see that progress is to kind of let go of that outcome and focus on each day at a time working at your dog's pace. Exactly. It has to be that their pace. Exactly, Mariana, which is why I love videoing every session because it keeps you accountable. Come on, let's do the fun game which is look at Krishna's mistakes together. And let's, I'll tell you the things that I see in this video that I would do differently, right? So I think the beginning starts out well. Um, I think he looks pretty comfortable. He's offering the chin rest quickly. I do start to notice some signs of anxiety after like the fourth or fifth repetition. I think from this point onwards, that ear twitch there, did you notice that as my hand went over his ear, a small ear twitch? I would have noticed that now. I didn't notice it then. That one looked quite good. He raised his head there before I marked him. So he raised his head early and then he gave a lip lick there where he put his chin down. Ear twitch again. These little things are the things that videoing keeps you accountable for because I think I'm quite goal oriented in this training session. I think I'm just kind of steamrolling ahead, not noticing another ear twitch continuing to make it harder and harder ear twitch again and I finished it's not terrible I'd give it a b (laughs) I'd give it a b right but we're looking for a star training sessions like with this dog here and that's the thing that I have gotten better at and I think the thing that we try to give our clients is this idea that you have to go at the dog's pace and uh, you have to become an expert in reading your dog's body language without being too fixated on outcome. Um, I've got some really good questions here. Oh yeah, AJ's asking to explain the ear twitch. Yeah, sorry. That was just a, uh, um, I just went a little bit rogue there because I, I felt like it's helpful for folks to see that this is just a learned skill <laughs> that even I, I've been making mistakes for many years as well. And by just going through the process of practicing, reviewing, et cetera, we can make it 
so much better. Um, but the ear twitch for me indicated for Hera a little bit of discomfort around me reaching over him. I think that it was a little bit of him going like, ah, what are you doing? Um, he stayed opting in technically, but I think it was a small sign of him just being like, whoa, okay, 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 I can do it, but it's a bit intense. And I know him very well after working with him for many years. Um, but it actually took me showing videos to my colleagues for me to be able to see these things because I was kind of desensitized to his body language, I guess. Like I just had forgotten, <laughs> I, guess, I don't know, I got into bad habits. And so getting a, a, another pair of eyes on it was really helpful. Um, all right, all right, all right. There's one piece, uh, one topic, one piece of the puzzle here that we haven't really talked about. I've talked about this bank account, right? And that we have to fill the bank account up, build their sense of safety, their feelings of safety around the different triggers, the different stimulus um, to do with their care, and then hopefully find ways to give them choices, different levels of choice <laughs> as much as possible. But this was a piece of the puzzle I was missing for a long time. What about those moments that we now call no choice moments? Like what about when you can't do it co cooperatively? Um, and that's a really, really real and important thing to think about because a big mistake I made was not having proper protocols for no choice moments and not being clear with Hera about when he could have a choice and when he couldn't. That lack of clarity, I think, really poisoned my communication with him because he didn't know when he was going to be forced into something and when he wasn't. So to, for me, usually no choice moments are, they fall into like two different categories. So like necessary non-emergency procedures. So for example, Hira has had a yeast infection in his ear that he needed, I needed to treat it. Like you can't let them go on for too long. It's not good for the ear canal, et cetera, et cetera. But he was in a lot of pain and we hadn't been filling up our bank account in that area. So I was not at all certain that he would be able to do it collaboratively. In fact, I knew he wouldn't be able to. So that's an example of one, like I have to provide this care, but you're not ready. You know, what do we do when we face with a situation that we we're not prepared for and we haven't practiced it? Uh, and medical emergencies are an obvious, another obvious one, right? Um, so Ash, <laughs> Ash is the pup in the picture here he got bitten by a snake at seven months old in England. Who gets bitten by a snake in England? Of course, Ash found the only snake in England and antagonized it and it bit him. And it was an adder bite, which is actually really poisonous. And he had to be in an emergency hospital for like two nights and get IVs and all sorts of really horrible, scary things done for a pup that had only been in the home with us for three months. It was very stressful for us all. Um, so we're thinking about these two kind of moments these two pictures ear, like uh, sorry non-emergency but necessary procedures and medical emergencies um these to me are usually no choice moments let me know if there are any no choice moments that you're thinking about like how would i work with this with into the a cooperative care context with my dog the reality is we have to provide that care we can't not provide that care um but i don't want <laughs> i don't want the I don't want providing that care to drain that trust bank account too much, right? Because we're building up their safety. We're building up this idea that they have choice and agency. If every week I have to hold them down to trim their nails, is that going to like kind of leak out of the trust bank account? Yes. So this is what we can do to minimize the leakage from the trust bank account. <laughs> um, and you can screenshot this or take a picture of this slide. Um, if you want to just have it in your head, like the kind of uh, uh, little things um, that you need to keep keep in mind for this. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Harm reduction, just get it done. Now, for necessary treatments, first of all, it's worth saying, you know, what is necessary to me means, you know, you're at risk of mental, of like physical, it's like unhealthy for you to not have this done. I don't think that every single procedure is always necessary. So for example, when my dogs go to the vet, unless it's really necessary, I don't have them take their temperature or do things that are really unpleasant for them for no reason. If we can, if it's very obvious that they're fine or we don't really need that, it's just procedural protocol. I'll always question, you know, is this really necessary, especially if it's really uncomfortable, but if it's really necessary, if it needs to happen, we just need to get it done. Now, 
this is not fun for anybody but what I don't want to do is I don't want you to try to use your games in this context I don't want you to ask them if you're not going to honor the no so a big mistake I made with Hera is I was trying to build trust and feelings of safety and give him choices but I'd then be like do you want a bath and he'd say no and I'd say well you have to have one (laughs) <laughs> and he was like well why did you freaking ask me then <laughs> like what, what's wrong with you and yeah he's not wrong it was kind of a messed up thing to do um he needed a bath I should have just got it done in the way that was minimally stressful but without poisoning all of this communication that we've been doing so I wouldn't ask him to come to me I wouldn't um you know ask him to get in the bath himself I would just go up to him I would put a leash on him I would walk him into the bathroom and I would do it if I needed to um now again this is by no means giving you any specific dog training advice (laughs) I don't want you to get that listen to this example with Hera and be like well I'm going to do the same with my dog because that might not be safe for you and your dogs right I need you to make sure that you're working like ethically work with professionals who can set you up for success keep you safe forcing animals into procedures is dangerous they have teeth And we really don't want to force them into those kind of behaviors. Um, We want to it to feel good. So this is if you are if you're working with your own dog and you have to do procedures for them. So, for example, here is ear medication. I just had to get it done. I put a muzzle on him. I restrained him in the way the vet taught me and I did it very quickly. And then I took it off and we moved on. I did not negotiate with him, try to get him to do his chin rest or anything like that. So think about that when you're doing no choice handling moments with your dogs at home. And if you're working with professionals like veterinarians or groomers, it's really important to build a relationship with trusted practitioners that you feel really good about. Um, So often that means, you know, finding a veterinarian who also is interested in patient centered care or a groomer who's interested in patient centered care and, um, you know, talking them with them about the different potential things that could happen and what the they should do, what you want them to do in different scenarios. So if Hera ever goes to the vet, um, most of the time I'm there, but if I'm not there, if he growls, I want you to stop and I want you to call me. Or if or you can always like have communication with the veterinary team like that. Um, but lots of us need a little bit of extra help figuring out what the no choice moment protocols should be to see the least harm being done um lol steph in the comments is saying we worked with a cca trainer lauren to support us in this and that involved lauren watching us bathe murphy literally and i watch i will video myself <clears throat> doing necessary grooming with hera and send it to my colleagues to be like did i do anything could i have done anything better here to make it less stressful for him because I have to groom him poodles can get really unwell they can get skin issues all sorts like he needs to be he needs to be trimmed but and we're seeing progress but sometimes especially when he has other issues like GI issues or an ear infection for example which he has chronically it can be hard right so sometimes we do have to kind of basically weigh it up and say is this really necessary um is it a necessary procedure okay, great, let's think about how we're going to do this to not poison all of our work together and to keep everyone safe and minimize stress for the dog, et cetera. And for medical emergencies, you know, just do what you have to do. You know, (laughs) always do what you have to do for a medical emergency. It's not worth it. Um, But what I will say is if you're in a scenario where you're thinking, listen, I'm doing all the harm reduction strategies I can, and I still think that my bank account is draining 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 at a rate that I can't refill let me know if you're in that position because I was there with Hera I was at a place where I was like I need to bathe you every two weeks I need to brush you I need to groom you I need to do your nails I'm draining faster than I can fill (laughs) like and I'm like type a like I'm doing it three times a day I'm there ticking it off my list and you know it's not like I'm really trying my best and it's still it's still draining. And especially if we have other issues on top, like I've had times where my ADHD has made it really hard for me to have a consistent routine. Like someone mentioned, what do we do in those scenarios? I cannot say this enough, obviously under the care of a medical practitioner, use anti-anxiety stress reduction medications. Uh, In one of the resources I was listening to, um, a trainer said, anti-anxiety medications are cooperative care. And I was like, yes. Absolutely. I think some people think of it as like an opt out almost or like I'm not I'm just going to cop out and give them. No, it is part of 
it is part of the care for these dogs. Um, in terms of medications, obviously we always work with a veterinarian. Ideally we work with a veterinary behaviorist, but it's also realistically, lots of folks can't always afford um, or get that sorted out. So a regular um, like general practicing vet who has a special interest maybe in these things can be a really amazing um, source of help. And often I find that if you talk to your vets about this and say, you know, we want to use anxiety meds to make it easier for you and the dog, many of the time, many times they can be really on board with that as long as you just give them time and, and warnings in advance. <clears throat> the reason we use the medication, anti-anxiety medication in this mo in these moments is that fear is so potent. That experience of being scared, like, have you ever had that experience being held down for a vaccination as a kid or, you know, forced to swallow a pill or something like that as a young child? You remember that. And that's a biological imperative to keep you alive because you felt unsafe in that moment. <clears throat> Your dogs will remember things that are scary. And often that will trigger worsening fear in the future under those same conditions, right? So they have a bad vet visit, but they needed to go because they got bitten by a snake. Next time they're in the vet office, actually Ash peed himself after that. That he walked into the vet clinic, he pissed himself everywhere. <laughs> he was really scared going back in. Uh, I think we should have a really low tolerance for distress in these animals in this area before we ask our vets if we think it's appropriate to use meds to help them personally. Um, and I'll, I'll put that on record. Um, for me, uh, I really think it's it can be such a game changer in terms of that kind of bounce back in terms of that managing that trust account that you have with them. It can be the tool that unlocks success in many cases. Um, and of course, like I said, working in conjunction with veterinary professionals and behavior professionals likely in these cases. <clears throat> But giving your animal medication to improve their emotional state counts as cooperative care. <laughs> um, so I'm not a vet. I'm never going to recommend specific medications for dogs. But people often say, like, what should we be talking to our, do our do doctors about? And we sh there are different types of medications that vets can use with your dogs. And it will depend on <clears throat> on your dog and your dog's medical history, behavior history, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we use things like trazodones, gabapentins. I'm seeing some people in the chat mention those. <clears throat> Situational medication that you give before the no choice moment that can help mitigate stress, help mitigate the long-term effects. <clears throat> That's kind of like first line of defense, I guess. Um, next line up, sometimes with veterinary behaviorists, we will develop together a pre-med ritual with benzos, for example, like Xanax um, to help the dog manage their stress. Or in some cases, actually many cases, we have to use injectable sedatives. And that's where I am with, I was with Hera around the, around the ear infection, chronic ear infection situation, because he got so triggered by this chronic ear infection that would not go away that I ended up being like we cannot keep draining the account at this rate <laughs> I need to sedate him and I need to do a bunch of procedures under sedation and he's going to wake up and all that's going to have happened is he's going to walk into the vet clinic he's going to get jabbed in the ass he's going to play some ball and he's going to pass out <laughs> and uh, that that's okay I'm okay and I'll be there when he wakes up and I'm okay with that experience um, I can manage that for him uh, so sometimes we speak with vets and we work together and we figure out that that's what we end up having to do because there are very few scenarios where it's safer to manually restrain the animal than it is to sedate them, from my experience. Safety, safer meaning their emotional health and their physical health. So it's, there are very few scenarios, from my, my experience, where it's safer to manually restrain the dog than it is to, to sedate them. That's not always assumed by many practitioners because I think lots of practitioners have a pressure on them to get the procedure done so lots of veterinarians and groomers are doing their best but maybe they have clients who have in the past really been mad at them for not getting that nail trim done right so they might be thinking you just want the procedure done I'll just do it the way I was taught and that's normal <laughs> I would probably be doing the same thing so sometimes we have to actually go in and say like I actually want to do this cooperative care practice would you be interested in collaborating me with me on this um, so use meds if you if if I think is just like 
a really big thing for me because I didn't for so long and I don't know why because I was literally an actual dog trainer <laughs> and I don't know why I didn't do it I think there's like a mental block um, for lots of us so just shine a light on that mental block just be like there's a mental block here and I don't know why and Krishma's saying that we should do this but even Krishma sometimes struggles to do this so there's probably something here um, I think it's cultural bias conditioning from many years um, a society that doesn't take that the mental health seriously etc cetera, etc cetera. um give it a go though because once you once you break the seal <laughs> you can really see the effects and it can be a real game changer for folks um all right i talked a lot about that almost finished folks thanks for staying all the way you're all rock stars um last two things here if you're if it's if you're able to do it you can use distraction like ash for example we can pretty much get him through most vet visits just by feeding him. He's a really hungry boy, you know? Um, but Obi, this Shih Tzu, absolutely would never eat <laughs> in that context. Um, so if you if they're not able to be distracted, just don't bother. Don't ask them once. If they're not into it, that's fine. Um, uh, but if you can, that's a great thing to do. Uh, and then reparations. <laughs> reparations is the word that I use to refer to that trust building that happens after um after we have drained that bank account after we've d done a little bit of harm to their emotional um well-being as it, it's not our fault it needs to happen um but how can we repair the relationship rebuild that trust account um what is that going to look like we're probably going to be going back to basics with you know building feelings of safety <laughs> going back to basics doing consent games and choice games to remind them, refill that bank account again uh, and get them in a place where, you know, we can again start to, to withdraw. But all of these little things, medications, the different games, building safety, um, the way that you're going to manage the different things with like scratch boards or cutting their hair short, these are all different tools, tiny little tools. And we'll probably need to construct your own toolkit um, for your particular dog in a way that like manages that bank account really well um, and we often need to track data over periods of time to learn what works and what doesn't so if you do need help and you're watching this and you're going like okay I'm, I'm, I'm ready I've uh, I'm ready to kind of start the process um, I have a little extra time I'm feeling summery and energetic uh, we'll probably be funneling you into a private coaching program with one of our our trainers who specialize in cooperative care. So we have a few folks who really specialize in it, who often have their own really sensitive dogs. So have had to get really good at it. Um, and it can be a really great way to get that coaching that you need. It looks a little bit like this. You do an initial consult. We learn about your dog. We learn about your goals. We construct a training plan. And then you can join us um, for like packages, basically over monthly packages where we do little check-ins, live training, and we review and give you feedback on training exercises to kind of make sure that you're on track, keep you accountable, et cetera. Um, so it's a really fun, uh, fun way to keep yourself engaged and moving forwards. Um, and we're going to be um, introducing a subscription service as well around this, prog this program in particular, which could be a really fun way to like do a month and then take a month off for a holiday and then do a month again and and kind of with this idea of it being a longer term goal all right I have a few questions I'm going to stay until half past if everyone's down for that but I'll just finish up my little slideshow and, and stop and pause here while I take the questions and just thank you all for being here uh, if anyone does need to run go ahead I know it's been a minute <laughs> I've enjoyed just blabbering on about this um so thank you for listening and all your excellent comments and input if you want more information, I would definitely check out our Instagram if you haven't already. Our website has a library full of free webinars on different topics that might also be of interest to you. And we'll put this one there tomorrow, the day after. And if you are interested in getting any help or support from us, you can either DM us through Instagram or you can go and email us at info at Calm Canine Academy. So I'm going to take some of those like just questions that I haven't looked at yet uh, or like comments that I haven't really looked at yet. I always enjoy doing this <laughs> just like going back through and making sure that I've got everybody and got, um, got good questions, got your good questions answered. All right, let's have a little look. I'm at the scratch board section. <laughs> Give me a moment. We administer medication, no choice every day. We feel terrible, but their behavior meds and he needs them as he stopped playing all the games we did around medication. Sometimes 
you need to do no choice meds um, for a period of time. And often I'll do, if I have to do like little and often no choice moments, I do no choice and then a huge jackpot at the end, something really, really good at the end. Um, but it happens afterwards <laughs> and then we go on with our day and the bad procedure is over. Um, it can be really challenging. He stopped playing all the games we did around medication. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm really humbling myself here by telling you all the areas that I've messed up with Hera. Um, but I had the exact same experience with Hera. I was trying to give him meds and he would be so suspicious of everything I fed him. And my roommate, who's also a CCA trainer, Lauren, was like, let me try and train him to take the meds. And I was like, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible to do that because I tried it and it didn't work. Um, but she proved me wrong. And he now takes meds from me as well as her really easily, first time, no problem. Um, so just a fun little self-deprecating story to remind everyone that sometimes we get stuck in our own ruts and our own patterns around these things. Um, and it was so it was so humbling to me when Lauren did that because she'd also only been training dogs for like two years. And I was like, what? How did you do that, you magician? And I was like, you know what? I was just in a rut doing kind of the same little mistakes over and over again. It was so interesting to experience that. Uh, like very I felt like a client it was great um <clears throat> oh good question do you have any opinion on making these big no choice moments with primary caretakers um versus trying to maintain the relationship or should a third party do it what a good question this this question makes perfect sense so basically if you have to do these things should you do it yourself or should you outsource it to a, another a third party who can take the hit essentially um Often it can be helpful to spread care out between two caregivers if you are able to do that um, in the home to kind of like be able to replenish and drain your own bank accounts a little bit. Um, but it really does depend on the dog who we want to be doing the the the, the work. For Hera, for example, a third choice part, uh, third, sorry, a third party person doing the work would massively impact how he feels about strangers. Uh, so I think it would make his stranger behave related behaviors worse. And I wasn't willing to <laughs> to sacrifice because he's really developed a lovely relationship with new people, whereas before he was really scared. So for me and for us, it makes sense for me to do it. And I've been training and teaching my I'm teaching Lauren, my roommate, to do it as well so that sometimes she can take over a little bit if we're low on the in the trust bank account. But it really is an individual choice. And it's absolutely something that we debate a lot <laughs> and, you know, figure out what the best strategy is for your dog. And a really good example of like the little little choices that you can make in terms of their care. Oh, God, I struggle with the no choice moments and the everyday filling of the bank account. The balancing act is so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> it can be so challenging. Um, I I can't I can't tell you otherwise, like taking care of animals in a way that feels like aligned with our ethics and the way that we want to take care of them. It's not easy. Um, I do say that though the the journey is worth it and be patient with yourself on that journey you know you don't have to make all the changes straight away um even if you just start to do one small change um or even plan to do that change next year you know i'm saving up so that i can do this or i am waiting for my vacation so that i can start this new routine like whatever little thing you can do um to get you closer to that end goal um and being gentle with yourself when you when your timeline is a little bit longer than you would like, because that's not, that's not unusual. All right, I've got a long question here. So let me see if I can skim it and summarize. <clears throat> this person's asking about things, but these like necessary things being done with one or two people. So should you have one person to distract the dog or, or, um, or not? It's a good question I think it really depends like with Ash for example we have two people we have one person on the feeding end <laughs> and then the other person who's doing the procedure and that works really really well for him um but for other dogs I know that it would be the opposite uh so it's a really really challenging question but it's I often do find that 
we need to practice scenarios with one person and scenarios with two people. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. So I didn't have any video of that actually in this course, in this uh, webinar, but often we are practicing that consent game, but there's someone else touching the dog instead of us at the end, or, uh, you know, things like that. Um, we're practicing restraining the dog while someone inspects them. These, these are all different variations of the games that we play. Um, but that's a great point to, to bring in that sometimes we need to practice these games with a vet <laughs> and sometimes we have to get scrubs and put the, the scrubs on and pretend to be the vet you know and like buy a child's stethoscope and practice with them but it's very similar to what I see them doing with toddlers these days um uh, around their care procedures as well um Maya I'm a trainer but I did reach out to a friend trainer to coach me through cooperative care as I also miss my dog signs at times really really um so I identify with that so much it's so much harder to train your own dog uh, than it is with other dogs um, and getting that second pair of eyes on it taught, te teaches me so much even just videoing myself and then watching it back a week later if you're a little bit nervous about sending your videos to other people to review even that can be really helpful but that was another area I had a big block with Hera like two things that I didn't do I didn't use meds and I didn't film myself when I was working with him I think I just had my own stuff that I was like, I don't want to see myself on camera. Like uh, I've obviously gotten over that with my work moving virtual over the last few years, but that is something that you might be facing as well. It's like, I don't want to see myself training my dog at like 10 PM in my pajamas with my hair in a scruffy bun. Like, Ugh, just, it's fine. You look great. <laughs> you look amazing. You're doing it. <laughs> um, I want to say that I appreciate your transparency on mistakes. It helps me not be so hard on myself. Honestly, that my transparency around my mistakes has been part of my healing process around this because I would beat myself up so much. And then I would want to achieve my goal, you know, to prove that I'm a good trainer. And that like that mentality just like kept going in my head. And it was when I actually started saying, you know, I have a problem, guys. <laughs> I really want this. I want to achieve this. And I'm struggling with my own kind of emotional regulation a little bit in this area etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's no shame um I came from a culture where mistakes were really punished and shamed and that's part of why this cooperative care stuff was so interesting to me because the idea of you know Hira says no and I feed him a cookie anyway that like revolutionized my thought I was like oh whoa so he can do this thing that I actually don't want but I can still feed him and be kind to him and give him what he needs and I can still see success in the future I was like what this must be a scam um but it's part of like this toxic communication culture that we have where we are taught that control is the only way that we're gonna um get people to do what we want <laughs> um but not true um we found moving away from the third party was a big thing. So he let you handle him in ways that he wouldn't let another one. Yeah. So it really depends on the dog for sure. Um, some really nice um, things here in the, in the chat here. Um, is it okay to distract? He copes much better when he's being fed, but we also don't want to poison the food. Great point here. So I said, I mentioned it's okay to distract your dog. Um, during no choice moments. I could probably clarify a little bit more about that. I accidentally poisoned food with Hira because I fed him while I did grooming procedures. And then he started eating less frequently with less excitement, with less intensity over time, but I wasn't really watching or tracking. So I didn't notice. Um, if you are gonna be distracting your dog with food, I really recommend you keep a close eye on how interested they are in eating, especially after that event. Because if you're seeing any hesitation, you're seeing your dog become fussy or picky with food or just not hungry, that might be a sign that we are actually, that distraction isn't distracting them from the bad thing. <laughs> actually, the bad thing is just poisoning or becoming associated with the distraction. <clears throat> So great point there, Steph, to look out for that. Um, another example of really why we wanna be using all the resources we have to help guide us in this area. Um, oh, I've got some good questions about prioritization. Oh, that's nice guys saying that it's helpful to hear about my experience with the shame, the shame. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to answer this last question and then we're going to finish up today, I think, because it's about half past. We've been here for an hour and a half. We must all be tired. Um, 
This is a really good question. It probably applies to lots of people. Do you have any advice on prioritizing training? We have other major issues behind hand besides handling. Um, and I'm struggling to deal with it all at the same time. Listen, this is such a good question. Um, really, really, really good, uh, good question. Uh, many uh, dogs that struggle with handling will have other like comorbid, you know, behavioral concerns or sensitivities that could be dog issues, issues with people, issues with noises, scared in new environments, difficulty regulating their arousal or their physiological, um, you know, responses to things that pump them up. Lots of different things. Separation anxiety, very common. Firstly, if you're seeing lots and lots of different labels that would describe your dog's behavior, we need to go to a vet, <laughs> like a really good vet, usually a veterinary behaviorist. Um, the American Society of Veterinary Behaviorists is a nice place to start. AVSAB, you can check them out. Um, because there's likely something else happening. Either the dog's experiencing chronic stress that's just making all these different systems um, light up and we need to deal with that, usually with stress reduction medications as a part of a holistic plan. But also there might be something medical going on underneath this. Uh, definitely check out the pain and behavior webinar for a more thorough discussion of this with an actual veterinarian <laughs> so uh, you can learn more. Um, but first thing there is really we're going to be really checking all the corners in the medical area to make sure that there's nothing going on there with that dog before we even think about training because i don't want you spinning your wheels trying to work with a dog that's in a chronic stress state that will make you feel rubbish it'll make them feel rubbish so we need to fix what's actually at the root of that but other than that what we usually do our triaging process is we write down all the labels <laughs> that we could use to describe the dog's behaviors and we take into account what's most important for the dog's welfare. So what is it that's causing the dog the most stress on a daily basis? We take into account the human welfare. What is it that the human really needs? So maybe your dog has separation anxiety and you're like, this is really important for me that we tackle this first so that I can get my life back. I'm a single guardian, et cetera. So we take into account both of those welfare statuses usually. Um, and then we think as well about like practically, <laughs> like what's gonna be the, the best way forward. Cause like, Frequently, we see dogs that are struggling with sound sensitivity in the home or, you know, struggling to rest in the home because they're so anxious, struggling by, to walk in the neighborhood because they're so stressed. Is handling the place we start with these dogs or maybe do we try and get them sleeping the 18 hours a day that they need and feeling safe in the home so that their nervous system can be regulated, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really thinking about those three things. We're thinking about the dog's welfare, the human's welfare and then success. <laughs> Are we going to see success fastest? Um, and I want I want to see behavior change to improve everyone's welfare. Um, so how are we going to see that the fastest? great question and maybe if other people are in this um oh maya thanks for posting the absav um link there uh, and thank you for thanking me it was so nice to hang out 